Um, so I will show you some work that I have been doing for the past few months. This is work in progress. And uh, the problem statement is uh, quite simple. Uh, so suppose you have a target species or genus, and I'll uh, label that by the letter T. And uh, this means basically uh, some bacterial species or some archaeal species, some prokaryote, because we're talking about metagenomic data sets. Um, and then uh, we have a collection of metagenomic data sets, um, some number. Um, and then we want to ask the question, is the target species present in each of these data sets, right? So that's basically the problem that I want to address. Um, this is uh, kind of a needle in a haystack problem, uh, very familiar to bioinformaticians. Um, but there are some additional constraints. The first is that the data sets that I am assuming are all shotgun data or total DNA, not 16S. Um, and I will also assume that they are pre-assembled, which means that the input for the problem is actually a collection of contigs. And we also want not only information about presence or absence, but uh, we also want information on relative abundance of T wherever T is found. So I'd like to justify some of these constraints. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, why not? Why, why not use 16S? And the main reason is that 16S in general does not allow for species identification. And even for genus, uh, classification may not be reliable, uh, depending on the genus. And finally, uh, maybe 10 years ago, five years ago, it would make sense to uh, not exclude 16S. But nowadays, the number of metagenomic data sets based on shotgun data has increased so much that it's uh, it's a uh, it's a, a very rich collection of data sets that uh, needs to be mined. And uh, I think it, it, it makes sense to focus on these data sets. So uh, in terms of the biology, I would like to briefly motivate this problem. So suppose the collection of contexts are metagenomic data sets of hospitals around the world. And suppose T is Acinetobacter baumannii. This, for those who don't know, is a deadly multi-drug resistant bacterium. So solving this problem would be a highly relevant uh, public health uh, concern, would be beneficial for public health, especially after uh, the pandemic that we've just been through. Another motivation is uh, work that I did and I will actually present to you as part of this talk and that I call the Xanthomonas census. Xanthomonas is uh, a bacterial genus and is one of the most important genera of bacterial plant pathogens. Um, and in view of the uh, very large collection of metagenomic data sets, uh, we can, it's now within reach uh, a census of Xanthomonas based on these data sets. Um, so the target in this case would not be a species, but it would be a genus. And um, I presented preliminary results concerning this census at the seventh Xanthomonas Genomics Conference, which was held in Florida last June. And uh, that was uh, part of the motivation why I attempted to do this work. So uh, some, some of you may be wondering, well, isn't this problem already solved? And yes, there is a standard solution to this problem, which means uh, run a taxonomic classification program on the context and look for T in the output. And there are several programs available for doing that. Uh, two of the most popular are Kraken2 and Kaiju. Um, and I... Uh, we'll briefly mention that these programs rely on specially built databases, 
and are based on KMER profiles. So they, they collect all the genomes that are available for prokaryotes, then they uh, pre-process these, uh, these genomes, uh, establishing what KMERs they contain, and then uh, this speeds up considerably the search. And these programs have been very useful and, um, and are very important. But my question here is, uh, can we do better than these programs if we are looking for specific targets? Uh, Kraken2 and Kaiju are general purpose programs, right? You, you run them on, on your data set and they will look for uh, every uh, species that uh, belongs to their uh, databases. And uh, I am interested in answering this question. And do better in this case means primarily a lower rate of false positives. Um, and from the Xanthomonas work that I did, uh, I found out that there was about 2% of false positives. And 2% may not seem like much, but at least for me, it was uh, uh, an incentive to uh, pursue this work. And I want to stress that uh, doing better here does not mean faster. Uh, both Kraken2 and Kaiju are very efficient programs, and I am sacrificing speed for accuracy. Okay, so in what follows, I'll show you a methodology for the Xanthomonas study case. I'll present you results. I will talk about issues that came up in that work, which led me to revise the methodology and then new results for other targets. So starting with the, with the methods for the Xanthomonas, uh, I want to mention that uh, I established a minimum contig length of 500 base pairs. If you go below 500 base pairs, uh, this phylogenetic signal becomes too weak and it's just not worth it. Uh, and for the taxonomic classification, uh, the methods that I'm going to show you are really simple based on just two steps and illustrated here. So I have the contigs here, which I feed to Kraken2, one of the programs that I mentioned to you. I use parameter confidence 0.1. The default is zero. There was a talk yesterday uh, in which the uh, presenter mentioned that they also used Kraken2. Uh, it was about meta transcriptomic data. And um, they used confidence 0.5. But if you use confidence 0.5, uh, you run the risk of leaving out uh, lots of uh, false negatives. I should also mention that this parameter confidence, in spite of its name, it doesn't really have a statistical uh, base behind. It's just uh, an analysis of how the, the, the different cameras map to the database and, and they're able to, uh, to uh, improve on the results uh, if you increase the value of confidence, but it's not really statistical confidence. And so the second step uh, for those contexts that uh, Kraken2 labeled as Xanthomonas in this case, then we run a BLASTN step. And the BLASTN uses as database simply the whole of GenBank, the NT database, and uh, we classify uh, the result as Xanthomonas if the first hit has at least 85% identity to a sequence classified as Xanthomonas uh, in, the gen in GenBank. And this means that the true positives are those contexts that pass the second step in this methodology. So why 85%? Uh, for that, I did a comparison of uh, a selected subset of Xanthomonas genomes, uh, which are shown here. Uh, this, is, this is an all versus all comparison using the FAST ANI uh, program, uh, which is a, a very fast program that uh, uh, gives you an approximation, a very good approximation of the percent identity between any two sequences. And it works well for um, uh, complete genomes, complete bacterial genomes. And so you have a bunch of, of numbers there, um, and this graph summarizes the results. So if you stick to 
uh, Xanthomonas against Xanthomonas, you find out that uh, the smallest ANI is 79.5%. Uh, so that would suggest a threshold for determining whether a uh, new genome is actually uh, Xanthomonas or not. But then I used uh, an out species, uh, Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, which is also a gamma, bract gamma proctobacteria, which is closely related to Xanthomonas, but it's not a Xanthomonas. And uh, doing the fast ANI against the set of, of, of Xanthomonas, I found out that the largest value was a little above 82%. And so uh, this motivates the 85% that I adopted, uh, which uh, is conservative, right? So I will only classify in the second step uh, a contact as being Xanthomonas if it has at least 85% identity against um, uh, uh, the hit in GenBank. So uh, being conservative, of course, decreases false positives, but there will be false negatives which means that some of the counts that I will present to you uh, are probably uh, underestimates. Okay, um, in addition to finding uh, Xanthomonas in those data sets, um, I, I want to uh, know which species were found, right? And this requires me to um, establish uh, other thresholds. Um, and the thresholds are those that you see here. So 85% is whether it's a Xanthomonas or not. And then 95% is a probable known species. 98% is a known species. So these three thresholds allow me to um, do the, the work. So which data sets? So I mentioned that it was a worldwide census. So uh, this was a pilot. I actually didn't collect all the metagenomic data sets in the world and did that. I wouldn't have the computational power to do that. So from my own research, I used a composting data set, then Atlantic rainforest soil, freshwater reservoir, howler monkey feces. And from collaborations, uh, I used uh, data sets of sponges in the great Amazonian reef system. And finally, the Madison project. Um, for reasons that will be clear very soon, uh, I need to um, stop a little bit and, um, and do a detour and explain to you the Metasa project. So the Metasa project is a global network of scientists and clinicians developing knowledge of urban microbiomes by studying mass transit systems and the built environment and hospitals. So uh, the, the driver behind all this is Chris Mason, who is a professor at uh, uh, medicine, uh, medical school, uh, Cornell Medical School in New York. And uh, they published a paper describing initial results uh, last year in Cell. Uh, they, all, they were also featured uh, in the New York Times uh, at the same time that the, the, the Cell paper came out. Uh, so, um, I am part of this network, so I had access to their data sets. Um, uh, what they do uh, in this project is they do surface swabbing and, and then the teams collect samples from high contact surfaces found in most metro and transit stations and systems around the world using ticket kiosks, turnstiles, railings, seats, and benches. So, uh, it's, it may sound like it's a small detail, but for the Xanthomonas results, it, which um, were surprising, uh, it was important to uh, make clear where the samples came from. Uh, all the sequences that they did was on this Hudson Alpha Genome Sequencing Center. They did some control for contamination and uh, here are the data set sizes. So in terms of number of contacts. So the soil is 300,000 contacts, composting a little more than a million, the reservoir a million and a half, and Metasub 80 million. So you can see that the Metasub data set 
um, dwarfs in size the others. And I'm not mentioning some of the others that I listed before because I didn't find any Xanthomonas in them. I only found on these four. Uh, the vast majority of contacts uh, is less than 10 KB. Uh, and the largest metasub contact has about 160 KB. Okay, so here are the results. In composting, I found basically uh, uh, a little more than 30 hits. In the reservoir, six hits. In soil, four hits. And then metasub, boom, lots. 50, 54,000 here, 1,300 here, 2,600 there. So that's why I wanted to explain to you the Metasub project. Because when I started out doing this, my expectation was that I would find lots of Xanthomonas in composting and soil. And probably Metasub, I wouldn't find any. But uh, my expectations were totally the opposite of what I actually found. And in terms of uh, known species, uh, uh, Xanthomonas campestris uh, was by far the most uh, prevalent, uh, but uh, lots of others as well. Um, there is a difference between the, uh, there's not much difference between the probable and the uh, known species, suggesting that the 95% uh, threshold doesn't really uh, make a difference between uh, these two categories. Um, uh, one question is, did we find all known species of Xanthomonas? So GenBank lists 36 species with genomes, and we found 18. So that's about, that's exactly half. Uh, perhaps a few more could have been found if I had searched against WGS. So WGS is this whole genome shotgun database at GenBank, which is huge, and... Um, uh, it's, it would be interesting to search there, but uh, again, computational power becomes an issue. Uh, I mentioned to you that abundance was also part of the result that I wanted to show, but I will simply stick to just one table, and the table is this. Uh, we found Xanthomonas campestris in, in relatively high abundance in Marseille and Hong Kong. Uh, in terms of contexts per million contexts of at least 500 base pairs. And then there's this other species called Hortarum, another Ilvisicatoria, but you can see from the numbers that uh, Campestris was by far the most prevalent. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm not spending time on this is because these results are difficult to interpret. Why Campestris showed up in such large numbers in these two cities. I have no clue, except to say that Marseille and Hong Kong are both port cities, and that may have something to do with that. Okay, what issues came up uh, during this investigation? Uh, the first is that we can't really rely on GenBank, the anti-database for the ground truth, which is exactly what I did. Um, and the reason is that uh, in presenting the, the, the work at the Xanthomonas conference, uh, I was uh, asked about this. So how, how can you um, believe that a certain fragment that is in GenBank is really Xanthomonas, right? And it, it is a known fact that there are lots of misidentified genome fragments in GenBank. And so the solution for that was to, do a, uh, the, to change the second step and instead of searching against the whole of GenBank, just search against a local database of complete genomes of the target species or genus. Also, I added a minimum query coverage requirement of 80%. Uh, as a side comment, uh, this kind of work, in principle, should allow someone to do uh, uh, to um, provide an, an answer to what I call the pan-species problem which is, we would like to know how many uh, new species of Xanthomonas are there in the world. It's not a, an easy problem to solve. I'm just mentioning it because I think it's interesting. So for the second round, I forgot about the other data sets. I focused on Metasub, and I this time searched for spe specific species. And those species that I'm listing here were chosen based on the 
cell paper that the Manasa project uh, reported, right? So we have, uh, and these are for the most part the most abundant that they found. So you have the, the, the first two are common uh, skin bacteria, uh, Stutzerimonas stutzeri was previously called Pseudomonas stutzeri. It's a, a bacterial plant pathogen, uh, but apparently it's also found in other environments. Then there's Stenotrophomonas maltophilia that I mentioned before, Radiorhizobium diazoefficiens, and Acinetobacter baumannii, which is that uh, human pathogen that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so this is the methodology uh, with the changes based on the results of the Centomonas. So we have a local database here. And uh, in the case of uh, how can we classify the results of the BLAST, we apply a T-specific percent identity threshold. And so how do we determine that? So we use all complete genomes of T. We do the same all against all fast A and I computation that I showed you before, determining the smallest value S. And then we take a one different arbitrary different species of the same genus and we do the fast A and I against all genomes of T. We try to, to um, no, it's just an arbitrary uh, um, species of the same genus. And then we determine the largest value L. And then if L is greater than S, we adopt as our threshold that value L. Otherwise, we adopt the S threshold the value S. Uh, so here are the results for the six species that uh, I was targeting. Uh, the identity threshold, as you can see here, varied among them. So we have uh, in red, you have the maximum, which was 98.1 for uh, Micrococcus luteus. And the other one in red is the Stutzeri, Mona Stutzeri, 85%. And here you have the list of number of complete genomes that we used to determine these values. And um, Acinetobacter is by far the one who has the most genomes. Of course, it's a human pathogen, lots of interest on it. Um, and um, uh, it's worth mentioning here that uh, most percent uh, identity thresholds are well below the standard 95%. You may remember from the previous slide that I use 95% as a threshold. And the reason I use that threshold is because if you look at the literature, you will see that lots of people simply, when they want to determine uh, whether a certain bacteria is present or not in some situation, they will use 95% or sometimes 98% as their threshold, right? And, but the values that I showed you, uh, several of them are below that, which means that if you, let me go back here. So for example, take uh, Acinetobacter, right? So if you used 95% as your threshold, you would most likely get lots of false negatives. So the other comment is that, um, Anyone working on metagenomics nowadays will probably know that uh, we are facing uh, this big problem, which I call the disconnect between taxonomy and genomic similarity. And so taxonomic, uh, taxonomy classification is a uh, venerable, uh, uh, venerable uh, uh, study of bacteria. Uh, it's extremely important, but uh, uh, as the metagenome data sets uh, became more and more available, uh, this disconnect became apparent because uh, you start to see strange things like uh, two species that are very similar, but actually two genomes that are very, very similar, but they are named as different species and the opposite. Things that are uh, bunched together under a same, same taxonomic label, but uh, at the genomic level, they are very different. So that's what I call the disconnect. And in doing this kind of work, I'm just going head on against this problem, right? Uh, if for some reason uh, different species had been uh, determined based only on genome similarity, I wouldn't have this kind of problem. Okay, so results uh, are here. Uh, the number of hits, as you can see, uh, uh, for the first two are very high, more than uh, 2 million and then 1 million. And here you have the true positive rate as computed by the, 
the, the methodology that I showed you, right? And so we have here uh, values ranging from um, uh, a high of 98% uh, uh, to a low of 68% in the case of uh, Brady Rice Aldean, and also uh, nearly 85% for this micrococcus. So uh, the way I interpret these results is given on this graph, which is my last one. Uh, there is no apparent correlation between the percent identity uh, for uh, uh, identification purposes and the true positive rate that I computed, as you can tell here from these dots on this graph, right? So, uh, and here in red is the 95% uh, threshold that is very commonly used in the literature. And so you see that for at least for these three here, assuming this is maybe this is an, this of course is an outlier, there's, there may be something wrong here, but for these three, uh, adopting the 95% uh, threshold uh, would result in lots of false negatives. Okay, so the summary is that uh, if you really care about false positive rate, it's worth going beyond those standard programs that I mentioned. There are many caveats to this work. I, sh I mentioned at the beginning, this is work in progress. The method that I presented is quite simple, very straightforward. Uh, uh, and I think it, it, it can certainly be improved. Uh, the 500 base pair uh, minimum length requirement um, uh, may be not large enough. Uh, the definition of the specific percent identity thresholds uh, requires a little more care. And I didn't pay attention to false negatives. And also, of course, any kind of work uh, like this uh, needs to take that into account. And finally, the taxonomy genomics disconnect uh, remains a problem that needs to be solved. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Gianluca Machado da Silva, who's my PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo, Carlos Piropo, who's my um, system administrator, um, and Chris Mason from Cornell, who very gracefully allowed me to uh, use his data set, the data set that uh, uh, the consortium collected. And the funding uh, was made possible uh, by uh, these Brazilian research agencies. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much. Muchas gracias. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Joao. Please, any questions? Any questions? Luis Maribel. There we go. Joao, uh, Terry Gasterlin, wonderful talk. I just thank you. Um, so you didn't tell us the redo of the Xanthomonas. Um, are, are you finding it, are you, at, without revealing your, your results perhaps, but are you finding it at the same rate when you do this cleaner search? Um, if I'm finding Xanthomonas? In all the different meta sub, um, metagenomes when you do the refined search that I, I haven't done that I you know for for this talk I focus totally on the the new targets that I mentioned so I'll have to go back and redo it based on on the new methodology yeah sorry that, that, that'll be really interesting um so your work points to perhaps looking for human pathogens in all of these sample sets um are you going to redo, you know, you know, do this as well with all the, the human pathogens like Staph aureus, for example? Right. This is a great question. Um, and I wasn't part of the um, cell paper of the Medicine project, but I have a colleague who was, and he told me that uh, when they were writing up the manuscript, apparently there was a, a very important pathogen that came up. Uh, and uh, there was a debate uh, within the team uh, whether to report, because if you're gonna report uh, data sets of uh, subways around the world and you say, oh, 
there's this uh, pathogen uh, present there. This might be cause for a panic, right? Especially uh, after going through the pandemic. And uh, uh, I don't know, uh, the, I, I don't think the team uh, uh, omitted any results. Uh, I think that specific uh, pathogen that was pointed out was actually a mistake, a misidentification. But as you can see, I, uh, Acinetobacter baumannii, which is a very important human pathogen, was reported in the cell paper, and I also found lots of it. And uh, well, uh, how, what do you do with that, right? Is, I think this is your question, right? Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's basically important to know that on the one side, um, you have to be careful because uh, these bugs are everywhere. On the other side, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know if I'm answering the question you asked, but the more I say, the more I feel like I am trying to be an infectologist, which I'm not. I'm not an infectious disease expert by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, I'm, you know, just a humble bioinformatician <laughs> and these bugs come up and uh, well, well, I don't know. Well, sorry. Great, thank you. So please, Maribel. Thank you, Joel, for the great talk. Um, and thank you for doing this work because it's going to be very useful for, <laughs> for many people we haven't there to, to do it. So you were, you were talking at the beginning about this 500 length that you asked yourself, uh, have you tried with other uh, genus besides Centomonas? Because it can, as, as you already proposed, it, it might not be, a, it might not, it might, it might not apply to to all bacteria or all other species, right? Right. No, I haven't done anything besides what I showed you. Uh, this is work that I started uh, sometime in April. And so we are what in uh, in November, and uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's not even. And so I mentioned a doctoral student of mine, and he's helping me with this as a side project because this is not his main line of research. Um, and uh, and but the more we get results, the more exciting it becomes. And so I'm looking forward to coming back and refine the results, as I was telling Terry, and, uh, and then maybe do for some other uh, uh, genera. Uh, but one drawback of this kind of work is that uh, it feels like for every new target, you have to redo the whole thing, right? Yes. Not redo, yeah. but you have to calibrate, you have certain mm -hmm. very specific. But as far as I can tell, there's no way around that. If you want to improve what you already get with Kraken 2 or Kaiju or any other program, there's no other way other than uh, being very specific about the target that you're mm -hmm. interested in. True. Thank you. Thanks, Joao. Um, do you think that how open the pan genome is for a genus would be also a good idea to consider in the threshold? So not only look at for how close is the concert part of the genome, but also how many genomes are in the variable part of the pan genome of a genus? Right. Um, so um, when you when I say pan species or pan genus, um, then mm, I think what your question is is that. Could I somehow connect this kind of work with the work on pan genomes, right? Because when you do a pan genome computation, you determine the core genome, you determine the pan genome, you determine the accessory genome. And here I'm suggesting that it would be interesting to compute the pan species, meaning how many species are over there? And then once we are able to obtain a, 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 an answer for that, connect the two things. Is, is that what you're asking? Kind of, because in your threshold, I feel you are 
you say you mentioned that you were looking how close were the genomes of the same species yes and that's with the ani i guess yes and that's only comparing the conserved part of the genome but maybe if you find some genes that belong to uh, baumani for example but that's not in the conserved part of the genome then it's going to be a false negative because it's a, a new gene, no? Right, you're perfectly right. Uh, I, I am, so in the case of species, um, this is, would be less of a problem assuming they are closely related in terms of their genomes. But in the case of genus, it would be more of a problem. Yes, the, I think you're, you're right. Um, if, if it so happens that a fragment belongs to a non-conserved part of an, an accessory part, it would be a false negative, yes, yeah. But that's where uh, my question was, maybe adding some, um, some value to the threshold, some uh, maybe a zoom or something that reflects the point that that genus is really open or that uh, genus is so close that you don't need uh, to consider that. Right, Yeah. I think this is an interesting suggestion. I mentioned as uh, one of the things that I would like to do is to improve on the, the thresholds. And also, uh, I think your question uh, implicitly uh, uh, would bring up the question of uh, horizontal gene transfer, right? Mm -hmm. Horizontal gene transfer would be a big problem here because uh, uh, it would uh, either contribute to a false positive or contribute to a false negative. And uh, in bacteria, uh, horizontal gene transfer is a rampant uh, pro uh, phenomena. And uh, how do you deal with that in this kind of case? Right? So I think the answer is that there are limits to what you can do, right? I'm, 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 my work, um, as I think should have been clear from my presentation, aims to improve the accuracy but there are limits to what you can do based on these different phenomena. If you're going to take all of them into consideration, then you might be bogged down and not get anything done. So. Uh, Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, th thank you for a lovely presentation. Uh, and, I, and I hope this is going to be stating the obvious, but all, all, all the data that you used was given by other scientists that publicly or uploaded their, their science onto publicly available open databases. You, if you had to start from scratch, you, you just would not have been able to do this science. Is, that, I, is, that, is that correct? If, if I were to start from scratch? Yeah, if, you know, sampling and all the rest of it, you would never have been able to do this. Um. I, I, sorry, but uh, okay. No, I, the, the I, last... I, I, I suppose. Sorry, I suppose the point is, all all the data that you used was was made publicly available on open databases by other scientists. Right. Yes, and, that's and, exactly and, right. And stating the obvious is, it's incredibly important that this, that sharing this data continues into the future. Yes, I completely agree. Yes, and. Uh, the number of, of metagenomic data sets, as I mentioned, uh, has been growing exponentially. So um, for this kind of problem, I don't have a lack of data sets to use. What I do have a lack of is computational power to go after all of them, right? Yeah, limited by the computers. That's a good place to be. <laughs> um, so I might suggest perhaps a step three, and this is in response to the prior question, and that's, you know, once you know that a particular data set has um, context, to then go back and ask, you know, to what, ex to reassemble basically those contigs against your, your, your complete genome, because you have some complete genomes from the target. So if you went back and did a certain amount of scaffolding type assembly um, against your target, you could really make some strong statements about what's present. Excellent suggestion, Terry. Thank you. <laughs>